Um, first of all, apologies. Um, those of you who have come from the other side of the United States or even from the other side of Chicago, hoping to hear me speak about external ordering as well as internal ordering, I won't have time to look at external ordering. I'll just focus on internal ordering and the lack of this. But please bear in mind, of course, that everything I'm going to be saying about internal ordering in the tropics is really affected by many uh, forms of ordering. And one of these is the um, U-shaped forest transition curve and the uh, sustainable forest management, which is supposed to gradually uh, uh, evolve uh, and it is a necessary condition for uh, stopping deforestation. The U-shaped uh, curve is almost too good to be socially true because it implicitly assumes an ordered society in which the institutions necessary for sustainable forest management can be introduced and also that forest cover in the country as a whole can respond uh, collectively um, according to this continuous function. When we look at societies in the tropics, we see um, a remarkable lack of order. Of the 48 countries containing the majority of tropical forest, 24 experienced civil wars after 1950, and 19 still experience insurgencies today. Disorder is particularly common in forested areas, as uh, others have commented beforehand, because the forest canopy protects the rebel strongholds and movements from uh, surveillance. Can this disorder help to explain why at most only 6% of all tropical forest is sustainably managed? If it can, then we, ne we need a better understanding of societal disorder um, in order to explain how forest transitions occur in the real world. Yet apart from uh, some historical studies of indigenous opposition to colonial regimes, and recent research into how natural resources can cause or even prolonged armed conflict, there's been relatively little systematic analysis of the impacts of disorder on forest management. That is why uh, this session is so important. And my paper today is an attempt to contribute to filling this gap. It portrays disorder along a spectrum from uh, just ordinary lawlessness at one end to insurgencies and civil war at the other. So what is disorder? I define disorder as a society in which there's a chronic lack of <laughs> compliance with societal norms and this exceeds an acceptable and potentially detectable level of lawless behavior. It's a generic definition and you will note that it recognizes overlaps between lack of compliance with state laws and political activism, but it's non-judgmental about this. There are other qualifications to this, uh, to this definition which I'll refer to very close to the end of my talk. Now, in my understanding, I like to present disorder along a spectrum from uh, lawlessness to civil war. Lawlessness involves simple illegal activities like uh, illegal logging, uh, encroachment of peasants into forest reserves, etc. Disorder escalates in um, uncertain in insurgencies when armed rebel groups create disorder in or even control uh, parts of a country, often with aims of to self-determination or even political independence. Civil war, on the other hand, is the most extreme form of disorder, spreading violence over a large part of a country as a rebel group tries to overthrow the state. In my presentation, I'm going to be using Thailand as an example of lawlessness, the Philippines as an example of insurgencies, and Sierra Leone as an example of civil war. Now, too well established explanations of armed conflict in the political science literature 
are that rebel groups are either motivated by the need to address uh, grievances of various kinds, or the weakness of the state um, creates opportunities for rebel groups to challenge it. Recent models have focused on identifying factors that create these opportunities for rebel groups to operate successfully, such as poverty, slow economic growth, rough terrain, large populations, etc. Grossman um, gave an economic dimension to uh, theorization when he proposed that the economic viability of rebel groups often relies on looting natural resources. A cross-sectional regression analysis by Collier and Heffler in 2001 um, found a lot of evidence to support this particular argument. But as some of us here are well aware, uh, cross-sectional regression analysis often uh, that uses very coarse proxy variables often uh, are not very reliable. <coughs> My own attempt to understand disorder is through a normative model of social ordering that enables us to understand disordered societies by, comparing, by comparison with it. And it has uh, three main components. Discursive space, institutional space, and policy instruments that I'll go through in turn. Now, discursive space, um, the model assumes that in every country State actors attempting to impose their worldview or discourse um, on society uh, do so by trying to perpetuate, by trying to um, communicate the discourse down the spatial scale from national right down to the ground. If they succeed, then they can actually determine that the very language that is used in society and therefore how people behave. Every society has a discursive space, in my understanding, comprising the discourses that um, operate at each spatial scale. Obviously, um, attempts by actors at national level to impose their discourses on uh, people at local level uh, can and very often are contested. The second component is institutional space. State actors also try to impose rules or institutions on citizens. These must be re reproduced at successively lower spatial scales if the uh, institutions and the policies that they are meant to implement are to succeed. So I represent this by um, an institutional space. Um, each of these columns can be thought of as representing the chain of command of um, a different government ministry, but the framework is also flexible enough to represent the uh, chains of command of non-governmental organizations or even uh, neo-patrimonial networks for those people who are into those kind of things. Each column, each row on the uh, vertical, on the horizontal, on the vertical axis represents, as before, the institutions at different levels on the uh, spatial scale. Difficulties in implementing national policies can be understood uh, in this way because if you're going to try to uh, reproduce formal state institutions gradually down to the local level, you already have a lot of informal institutions that are very well established and they will contest being uh, changed from above. Now, these two components are linked by policy instruments, such as advice, taxes, regulations, and bureaucratic administration. States use policy instruments to um, impose institutions by employing uh, one of four, or more than one of four, um, resources, information, finance, coercion, and organization. And we'll see how different actors use these resources in the talk that follows. Rebels also use these resources, but in very different ways. Now, I'll look in turn at the effects of three types of societal disorder on forest management, and I'll begin with lawlessness in Thailand. In societies with low to moderate disorder, the state attempts to control forests in the periphery of the country through a mixture of coercion and the organization of resources. Thailand's remaining resources are, as you can see, situated in the northern, western, and southern part of the country, uh, far away from the core region uh, of the central plain, at the heart of which is Bangkok. 
The Royal Forest Department, or RFD, has traditionally employed the bureaucratic organization of the forest management wing, seen here, to link the core with the periphery, therefore using um, organizational resources. The, um, sorry for the uh, quality of the slide, the um, chain of command links the headquarters in Bangkok to offices in 73 provinces and then a much larger number of district and local offices below. The effectiveness of the RFD has been limited by an over-centralized structure. People like living in air conditioning offices in Bangkok, naturally. <laughs> An associated lack of personnel in forested areas and other weaknesses. There are two main institutional conflicts that uh, we, we can recognize here. First of all, a lack of mutual recognition of traditional laws and modern laws. All forests in Thailand have been the property of the king since 1896, when the modern state um, started to evolve. And as in other countries, traditional, common, uh, pro traditional property rights are not recognized in modern state property right law. The law establishing forest reserves wasn't passed until 1964, and then the Royal Forest Department took a very long time to uh, delineate each of the forest reserves. So restrictions on access to reserves still seem recent in the minds of many people um, in the farming communities. And so they'll feel very little compunction in clearing forest land um, to which they feel they have a traditional right of access. Second, lack of recognition of all laws. Forest guards are regularly killed or injured in clashes with armed gangs of illegal loggers and wildlife poachers. The RFD's organization is very weak in uh, forested areas, um, so that is one reason. But even when the, the Thai military had a free hand to exercise coercion uh, in, this, uh, in this field in the early 1990s, it still could not stem uh, deforestation either. Two types of conflicts occur between discourses that we can uh, identify here. First of all, discourses on forest use. Foresters see themselves as tamers of the wilderness, imposing order on forest, uh, so they have to defend their, what we, call, what we might call their forest space, against the competing discourses of farmers who just want to go in, um, poach wildlife uh, for subsistence, or uh, grow food. The second type of conflict that we can recognize is between the perspectives of um, traditional, modern, and postmodern societies. In the 20th century, foresters clashed with traditional cultures by emphasizing the modernity of what is known as scientific forestry. And this has been exacerbated in recent decades by the adoption of new norms, complying with the post productivism of postmodern societies in developed countries. Again, our external ordering coming uh, into play here. Um, these societies need the symbols of eco-labels on their teak, wood, or other woods to assuage their cosmopolitan concern about tropical forests. Moving on to insurgency societies, here we have the uh, Philippines. Uh, and in countries like the Philippines that are facing insurgencies, some parts of the periphery may actually be controlled by rebel groups. The increasingly authoritarian rule of Ferdinand Marcos, who was president from 1965 to 1986, prompted two main strands of insurgency. The first was by communist groups such as the uh, New People's Army. That mainly operates on the islands of Luzon and Mindanao, and is said to have killed about 40,000 people. Second, Islamic groups fighting for independence on the uh, southern island of uh, Mindanao, down here, and the Sulu Archipelago that leads off it. <coughs> the Moro National Liberation Front actually signed a peace deal with the government in 1976, 1975, but the Moro Islamic uh, Liberation Front continues to uh, fight for an independent Islamic State. And those two groups combined are said to have killed about 200,000 people. <coughs> Both insurgencies exploit opportunities by operating from remote forested 
mountainous areas. But while the NPA raises quite a bit of funds from illegal logging and extortion of loggers, the MILF relies on kidnap ransoms. Now, the bureaucracy of the State Forest Department, this is how it was um, in the, the 1970s, um, parallels that of the Royal Forest Department in Thailand. It was just as ineffective. It was replaced in 1986 by a new Department of Environment and Natural Resources. The already weak chain of command of forest departments in this, uh, in, uh, of this kind are weakened even further by uh, rebel groups chipping away at their operations in peripheral areas. None of the insurgencies in the Philippines has, to my understanding, been uh, actually resulted in the closing of provincial or even district forest offices. But what it does do is prevent uh, forest, forest officers actually traveling about in the forests and regulating what goes on there. Insurgency groups may employ policy instruments to impose their own institutions. These include, first, using coercion and extortion in return for allowing loggers to be con continue with their activities. The NPA earns millions of US dollars a year from this. Second, excluding from forest users who are incompatible with their own aims, which are maintaining forest cover uh, to protect themselves from surveillance or logging. In some areas of Luzon, the NPA is actually replaced the uh, State Forest Department as the main hegemonic power over forest use. It can stop illegal logging when it threatens to make um, it, uh, it visible to outsiders. It's even halted operations of logging companies when they didn't fulfill the obligations of their concession contracts, which is quite something when you think about it. Elsewhere, it can protect illegal logging or it engages in illegal logging itself to gain money. Some concessionaires, of course, support these, uh, try to contest these new institutions by setting up private armies or working with the Philippines Army. Now, as far as conflicts between discourses are concerned, as Nancy Peluso commented yesterday, insurgency groups see the country through very different eyes. They, they have uh, a different discourse from the state. And that is how they see uh, the world in which they live. Local people who contest the state discourse may form a discourse coalition with rebels uh, for mutual benefit. The most widespread um, example of this, of course, is in the southern Philippines, where members of Islamic faith obviously uh, give succor to the uh, Islamic uh, rebel groups. But in Luzon, for example, indigenous peoples have gained a lot of support for protecting their way of life from uh, the NPA. And finally, we go to a civil war society. An insurgency began in the West African state of Sierra Leone in March 1989 when rebels of the Revolutionary Front, or RUF, took over the diamond fields in the uh, southeast of the country. The um, diamond fields are hatched here, and you can see that they actually coincide with the black areas which are the remaining areas of forest in Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone only has about 9% forest cover uh, remaining, and that's the region where they are concentrated. Now, the IUF's main motive was looting, although it initially gained support from uh, rural people angered by the elite's corrupt rule. The RUF was supported by Liberian rebels led by Charles Taylor, who sold diamonds from mines under the RAF control. The rebel area continued to expand, and eventually the insurgency uh, developed into a civil war. So let's look at the various conflicts between the um, institutions here. Again, you see uh, a bureaucratic organization of the Forest Division, and the um, RUF helped to, firstly, undermine one of Liberia's most fundamentalist institutions, the most fundamental institution, perhaps, of any state, its border. It eroded the border with um, Liberia, and uh, this allowed it to um, smuggle 
hundreds of millions of dollars um, of diamonds every year across the border so they could be shipped out from Liberia and used to raise money. You could say that Charles Taylor's neo-patrimonial network effectively straddled the border regions of the two countries. The scale of the disruption to the chain of command of the State Forest Department is likely to increase as disorder escalates from insurgency to civil war. Um, in Sierra Leone, the initial insurgency by the RUF rebels actually closed some of the um, uh, regional offices of the Forest Division. When, when disorder spread to um, the capital, Freetown, the Forest Division headquarters was itself taken over, ransacked, and burned, as with many other ministries, thereby disabling its entire chain of command. However, the arrival of the RUF allowed new forest institutions to emerge, dividing forests into two main domains. First, that controlled by the RUF, where illegal logging take pl took place. Secondly, um, those in areas outside direct rebel control, where people in local communities could establish their own power over the forest and introduce their own forms of community forest management, which were um, slightly more sustainable than those of the RUF or even the government. Of course, we had refugees going into the forested areas and also being displaced by the RUF, and they caused deforestation too. So now for a few conclusions. First, apparent patterns of change in forest cover take on a different meaning when disorder is taken into account. Relatively minor instances of societal disorder are at the heart of agricultural encroachment into forests, but areas of closed forests that appear relatively static may mask the activities of insurgency groups who try to preserve forests for their own ends. Second, disorder has positive and negative impacts on the sustainability of forest management. In areas controlled by rebels, positive impacts arise from the maintenance of forest cover and the possibility of community forest management. But sustainability is reduced by the prevalence of illegal logging and by deforestation caused by refugees. Third, whereas in simple lawlessness, the basic problem is an incompatibility between modern state institutions and traditional institutions, as disorder becomes more serious, informal institutions become increasingly important as ordering devices over forested areas. Of course, the uh, impacts on forest management vary greatly between countries according to how discourses on and institutions in forest areas interact with each other. In the Philippines, of course, we saw symbiotic relationships between the forest uses of different actors. But in Sierra Leone, uh, there was more emphasis on autonomous exploitation by different actors in different areas. So here's uh, my final qualification of the definition of disorder with which I started out. Although we may perceive social relationships as disordered when they don't comply with the formal state institutions, they do comply very often with a, a dense network of informal institutions and therefore have their own ordering function. This is not seen as disordered, of course, when seen through the discourse of the state, but it is seen as ordered by uh, the, the people um, involved in the rebel groups. So as insurgencies, civil wars, and lesser forms of disorder are so prevalent in the tropics, it's perhaps not surprising that sustainable forest management is so rare. What I would argue is that the more we learn about societal disorder, the more we shall learn about the conditions for achieving sustainable forest management and achieving the forest transition. Thank you. Alan, I'm uh, happy, really happy to see that you're, uh, you're sort of scaling up the analysis here, um, and, and it's certainly an interesting question. I guess one, um, one, another way to sort of cast this issue would be to, in terms of the, to what happens to different types of forests when disorder develops. And one sort of quick generalization, and I guess that's what I'd like you to comment upon, would be 
that uh, disorder turmoil is basically bad for primary forests because of the, lo the looting sort of effect, but good for secondary forests because it promotes depopulation and you get regrowth. <laughs> Certainly, I, I don't think uh, rebel groups differentiate between uh, primary forest and secondary forest. All they want is uh, to be hidden, and secondary forest does just as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, uh, Nancy Peluso, University of California. Um, I had two questions. One is, um, uh, at the end of the talk, you almost transformed your whole model because you said that um, uh, you know we have to understand the ways order works in a, in a way that might look disorderly from the point of view of the state. So my first question is um, does it make sense to kind of have this whole model that's about this idea of disorder and then come back and say well wait a minute it's not really disorder we've just got to think about different ways of ordering. It's how I understood what you're saying. Let me tell you my second question so I don't forget it. Uh, the second question has, has to do with the role of the military in a lot of these, these areas. It's not just the Forest Service, I would imagine, that's out there fighting the National Liberation Fronts of wherever, um, that uh, they do have significant um, uh, military backup. And, and that didn't come into the discussion either, so I was just wondering if you could say something about that. Thanks, Thanks very much, Nancy. Um, on the, the first question, my model is of ordering. And um, so it's a generic model which I've developed actually for another purpose, and that is to be able to explain any form of policy implementation of whatever kind. So uh, what we saw there was that you can see the model as representing order coming down, formal institutions being uh, reproduced down the, uh, the, 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 the chain of scales, but there is no difference in the model between uh, the reproduction of formal institutions and, and informal institutions. So informal institutions do just as well. And in fact, one of the things I didn't have time to, uh, one of the things I, I, I didn't have time to um, include in my talk was that um, in a paper that I wrote in Land Use Policy at the start of 2007, I actually analyzed the state of Sierra Leone in two ways, and I, said, I suggested, well, maybe the, uh, the real um, center of power is not the modern state at all. This is something that Paul Richards has argued. It, it, it's actually the neo-patrimonial um, shadow state that is controlled by the head of state. And this relies totally on informal networks that have a great reach. So you see, that's why I suggested that this model of ordering can apply to either the modern state or the uh, or the, uh, the the shadow state, uh, and and in fact the um, whether in fact the uh, the institutions in the modern state were reproduced uh, by the forest department um, perhaps doesn't matter one jot to the president of Sierra Leone or other countries because they know very well that they the institutions that really matter are being reproduced and strengthened. Um, on the second question, yes, I uh, didn't have time to talk too much about the military. Uh, there's a fascinating, uh, fascinating complementarities and, and conflicts involving the military and other actors, as I'm sure you're well aware. Um, concessionaires uh, will um, call upon the military to help them. They may form alliances, illegal loggers. Can, uh, can form alliances with the military who will not do anything about their illegal logging because they're all on the same side. And um, further than that, um, during the, 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 the close relationship, you know, people having uh, coffee over breakfast, a military person here, um, logging company executive over there, well, how do you like to join our board of directors, you know, and uh, you know, you'll get a Volvo or a Mercedes, you know, you take your pick. And these things have uh, really developed into, in the Philippines in, into um, something, uh, something quite extraordinary. Even the Minister of Defense, Ponsen Rile, um, had a huge uh, logging interest, and I think he had to do di divest himself of these uh, b before he became uh, minister. But it was, um, again, a, a highly complex, very dense sets of informal networks, and that's the way it works. Thank you. Mahesh, uh, thank you, Alan. It's a fascinating paper. I had two questions. One was, uh, I'm wondering whether looking at state sovereignty in the way we're used to looking at it, would it be, you know, a lot of pre-modern uh, states actually go through such tumult regularly. 
but some of them manage to incorporate what we see as disorder. So maybe we should, you know, thinking of 18th century Central India, the Rhineland after the breakup of the larger empires. So I think one is that question, should we actually be looking at pre-modern societies much more carefully? The other is a very trivial question. The very interesting instances in parts of South Asia of insurgent groups beginning to behave like states vis-a-vis -vis nature. So insurgent groups saying, you know, we're not involved with poaching. If there is a poacher of this rare species, we will sort them out. We know what they mean. Because they see that as conferring legitimacy on them. Mm. You could give an instance of the rival groups in the Rwandan civil war, uh, who between them killed over a million people, killing, I think, one or two gorillas. And I, at one level, it's very positive. But are there insurgent groups attempting to get legitimacy by playing, you know, nature's keeper? And are there, is, is that pattern at all evident in any of these things? Well, there, there was some evidence of this, um, but as, as I said to, to Tom, um, the um, insurgent group's main uh, thing is, of course, uh, preserving forest cover. Uh, but they may well um, indirectly um, pursue the aims that you require. Um, but just, just going on a little bit further, uh, le legitimacy is a, a very important consideration. Again, when you link the um, tropics to the uh, world outside. Symbolism is an incredibly, form, an incredibly important uh, medium of exchange in postmodern societies, between postmodern societies and, and, and uh, developed countries now. Um, and so um, if, the, if people like the MPA, who do raise a lot of money abroad, can get added legitimacy by passing back symbols of um, how good they are conservation-wise, they are not uh, going to uh, not, not going to pass by the opportunity, I don't think. On your first question, um, I, th I think um, the, the best answer is that we really need to uh, reconsider the whole, um, the, the whole way that we look at states. And, and in fact, uh, that is how the, uh, the model came about in a way, because the model was originally uh, designed to explain governance. Now, governance is um, far more decentered, far more complex. You don't, do, do not have um, compartmentalized national territorial spaces anymore. Um, and therefore, um, how do um, governments and other actors compete for political space? Well, in this model, they compete by, uh, for political space by means of their discourse and institutions. And according to Engelberg, Peterson, and, and Webster, fascinating book, this um, one other thing I didn't have time to talk about in, in detail was, of course, the discursive space and institutional space. If you take Martin Hager's definition of, uh, of discourses, where the reproduction of discourse and institutions are complementary uh, and inseparable, then discursive space and institutional space are just part of the, uh, just two sides of the same coin. And, and that means that what we're seeing here as, as formal state actors and informal state actors are trying to reproduce institutions and contest institutions, reproduce discourses, contest discourses. They're actually competing for political space in this very way. So um, we've, um, you know, Britain, is, Britain now is not the same as Britain when I was a boy. Yeah, and you need to, uh, perhaps we need to go back to pre-modern India to understand how things are really happening uh, in my country. <laughs> uh, the, the queue is getting rather long, so if we can keep the questions yeah. brief. I'll try and keep it brief. James Fairhead from Sussex University. Um, the, uh, it, it seems to me that you, in linking up with concepts of sustainability, you might have missed a trick in that that concept of order and the bureaucracy uh, lead, has a, a metaphorical link to order in the, the forest itself, that sense in which the forest can be ordered uh, and will respond to uh, the particular practices of particular foresters in a predictable way. The trouble is that the trees tend themselves to be insurgents. You know, things <laughs> don't follow the ordering that they're supposed to. Um, and there's a sort of metaphor of order that, that comes straight from the bureaucracy all the way out into the ecology. Mm -hmm. And yet your insurgents probably have a very different concept of what, an, what order is and a very different mm -hmm. concept then of what, uh, what sustainability and, and the ordering of trees would be. Now, mm -hmm. equally, they might not manage to get 
control, but maybe they'd have a different vision of what that <coughs> sort of order would be. Well, you're right. Um, <laughs> I have, Mr. Trick, and it's taken someone of your brilliance, James, to show me. Um, uh, that's probably the subject for my next book. Thank you very much. <laughs> All I can say is that uh, my, uh, you know, my, my um, model only go on includes humans so far, but I need to expand it even more. <laughs> um, Liliana Davalos, uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Um, could you comment briefly on the role of local populations in the emergence of this alternative order as, as this conflict escalates? Um, per particularly, in particular, for example, uh, you showed that um, in, in Luzon, the, the relationship between these groups and the people was different than, than it, could, it was, for example, in Moro, um, in Mindanao. So what is the role of the local populations, if at all, or is it considered in your model? Thank you. Yes, um, I think I said in my talk that um, all these things will vary uh, according, according to particular context. It, you can't really generalize. In, in Luzon, for example, um, you, you see the, the MPA actually co uh, cooperating with indigenous peoples and traditional peoples um, and uh, helping them to preserve their way of life by preserving their forests and preventing people getting into those areas. Um, in Sierra Leone, um, the uh, local people um, near the border with Liberia from where the rebels came originally initial, initially supported uh, the RUF because they thought that they would uh, be able to overthrow the, you know, the corrupt elite in Freetown. Um, but um, they soon learned that um, the, the RUF really didn't want to uh, be their friends. It just wanted them as kind of um, s slaves, effectively, that people were coerced and, and just taken from villages to be members of the army. Uh, and if they uh, refused, then they were killed. Uh, so um, you, it's, it's a very complex picture, but what, what, what the, the, the way that I um, kind of uh, simplified the simplified things was saying, well, you have areas controlled by the IUF, where you know they really need to control it, but very close to diamond fields. Others, uh, there may be forests that the IUF, for example, didn't didn't really uh, value very much. And, um, or in areas that they didn't value very much, and, and then the um, people would have autonomy to establish their own community forest management. Now, things are a, a lot more complex than that because, um, as Nancy said, you've got the military, and in Sierra Leone, um, you also got pseudo-military uh, groups as well. It's a very confused situation, but that's what's so lovely about Africa in particular, the complexity. Uh, Raymond Bryant, King's College London. Um, could you comment a bit about the broader theoretical perspective here underlying the model? Um, the talk about order and disorder reminded me of Foucault in the sense of kind of government in the Foucauldian sense. You know, Foucault talking about the right order of things and so on. Is there a link there at all or do you have a different sort of set of theoretical kind of perspectives there? No, um, I, I didn't want to talk about Foucault at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I, I, have, I, I love you too much. Uh, but uh, you know, Raymond's over there, you know, he's got this black shirt on, so I'm sure you'll be able to identify him afterwards. Um, no, you're right. Um, it, it is uh, Foucauldian in the sense that it, it, um, it, it takes its kind of, um, it, it goes further because Hage's definition of, of discourse is, is slightly more elaborate in that it, it, it includes um, institutions effectively as well as discourses. And um, I, I've got a lot of sympathy with this. Um, in, in fact, the, the relationship between discourse institutions has not really been uh, theorized very much. Um, Norman Fairclough refers to it in some of his books, uh, but only tangentially. But to my mind, it's one of the most important theoretical questions of today. Uh, and um, I, I'm just putting this out there and seeing what people think. To me, it seems to make a lot of, lot of sense. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll have, I'll have other people uh, coming at me. <laughs> 